So good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Sakai Teaching and Learning call for July 15th, 2020. Um, I'm your happy moderator, Charles Bristow. Uh, Trish Gordon is not going to be with us today, so it's all on me, I suppose. I am going to repost one more time the link to the Etherpad page so people can sign in. And do we have any update? Well, we do have updates and announcements. It looks like Josh put something in first, so go ahead, Josh. I think that was you? No, that wasn't me. No. Oh, no, it was Michael. I'm sorry. No, I, I mean, it's not really a Sakai announcement. I just wasn't sure where else to put it. This came across one of the lists where a member of our friends in Miami uh, just put out a Creative Commons licensed hybrid course uh guide so this seemed like the right call to share that kind of thing yeah all right thank you michael wilma looks like you've got a couple things yep so um sakai 20.1 was released on friday of last week so that's out and available now if um if you guys are looking to um install that upgrade maintenance um, upgrade for testing or um, you know if you want to take a, a closer look at it there were a hundred fixes in it it was an even hundred so it was kind of um, odd for it to come out to a round number like that but <laughs> so um, the uh, the other news on the release front is we're targeting um, mid-August for the 21 freeze date so it's it's sooner than we typically freeze and the reason for that is um, we want to try to get 21 out uh, at the end of the calendar year or very early in January so that's kind of our goal um, so we're going to freeze early to try to get that release out um, earlier and uh, get kind of on a better pattern for releasing um, at the very beginning of the year. So that's all I got. <laughs> Thank you. And I also just tack on and mention that uh, uh, Dr. Chuck, uh, in his wave of generosity for uh, for Sakai and, and Aperio, uh, contributed some additional funding over and above what he had already contributed to underwrite 500 hours of QA. So we're bringing on uh, another QA contractor to work with Andrea Thomas Kelsey, who worked, uh, who was a, he was a sort of a student at Notre Dame. His parents are there. He's not wasn't actually a student, but in a student-ish capacity, he uh, he worked extensively on the last cycle and comes very well recommended by Andrea. So we're trying to beef up the QA capacity uh, for this next cycle, in addition to moving the, uh, the the dates back a little bit. So thanks once again to Dr. Chuck for his generosity. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Chuck. Um, any other announcements? Should we mention the community meeting? Oh, yeah, that's right. That's next Friday, the 24th. Um, the Sakai PMC slash community meeting. That's going to be from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Eastern. And um, it's in Big Blue Button. I'm trying to remember which room might be room one. It's on the, the um, Imperial calendar, Sakai and Imperial calendar. Let me just check. Sorry, whoever's typing, I, you know, did a bad thing. Apologies. Yeah, it's in room one, Big Blue Button. Friday the 24th. Wilma, will, will there be a break for lunch on the East Coast? We'll have sort of um, some breaks throughout. So um, we're not going to break for like an hour, but, you know, maybe like a 20 minute break about halfway through. Um, so people could go grab something real quick and then maybe bring it back and continue the conversation. The, the idea is to have the PMC meeting first to kind of do the first hour for that. And then um, we'll have sort of breakout discussions. So those will be a little more free form and people can kind of come and go as, as they need.
Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> if there's nothing else, let's go on to the main part of today's call, which is a discussion of release management. Can faculty stomach change? Um, and we've got Josh Wilson from Longsite. He's supposed to be accompanied by Laura Geckler from Notre Dame, but she has not checked in yet. So I guess we'll just let Josh run with it for the moment and see what happens. <laughs> we'll see what happens. Um, in, in full disclosure, Laura and I did not coordinate. So uh, um, when she shows up, which I, I'm assuming she will, then she'll just jump in and we will do a fluid, exciting thing that we are want to do. So um, let me frame this conversation a little tiny bit. Um, so let's let's go back a bit to the uh, the spring PMC meetings where one of the topics of conversation was the um, was the, the question of our release model. So we currently utilize a major release model in which uh, features are released in dot zero of each version, which comes out uh, around the start of the year. We're trying to get this done this cycle in late December to better help schools that need more time to test and that run it run Sakai in their own data centers. Um, but that's our that's our current model, our our major release model, and we release bug fixes and you know minor improvements in dot releases, but no major features, no major changes to UI. Uh, the the argument for this, as I understand it, has been that uh, it's tough on faculty to change the, you know, significantly the LMS in mid-semester. <clears throat> on the other hand, there are people who argue for uh, a continuous model of release where uh, features might be released on a more regular basis throughout the year. People point to the various cloud services that they use at their institution, the, the Googles, the Office 365s, the Slacks, the Microsoft Teams and others, uh, the Zooms where uh, features change throughout the year and it's not really tied to the semester and somehow faculty and students manage. I mean, now granted, uh, you know, it's not easy. There needs to be lots of messaging and support needs to be ready and there needs to be a plan for this. All that is understood, but uh, you know, there's a, there's a well-established model now out there of continuous release, and a lot of our institutions deal with that in other settings. So, you know, I wanted to start a bit of a long-term discussion. So, this is uh, this is very much something that is looking pretty far ahead. So, this has no impact on Sakai 21. Probably has no impact on Sakai 22. Uh, it's probably, you know, it's uh, it's most likely to have an impact on Sakai 23 realistically because we need as a community to say, all right, is our major release model still the right direction? Um, if so, we continue on. Uh, if, if not, um, what is the evidence for that? You know, there's some there's some user studies to do. I don't think we as a community can sit here and say we're going to make a major change like that without more data. So there's gathering of more data, there's analyzing of data, you know, and if we decide to make a change to a continuous release model, you know, then we'd have to figure out how would we accomplish it sustainably. And uh, again, if we decided to do that, when would we have that change be effective? So there's a there are a lot of questions yet to be asked, and this is still a very preliminary conversation, but it makes sense to consult this group on uh, the question of can faculty stomach change? And I, what I would love to do is I'd love to start surfacing the arguments uh, for and against, you know, because I know that there are reasonable people can disagree as to whether faculty are okay with change to a core academic system in mid-semester. Uh, there are people who uh, have, myself included, the bruises from faculty members who've experienced such, such change. Um, there are, you know, others who say, well, I talked to lots of people who uh, would love to get new features. They'd love to get their hands on them and they don't really care when. Um, there are you know, people who say there's less of a change averse nature uh, among possibly younger faculty than, than older faculty. I mean, there are all sorts of, of angles here. And I wanted to take a minute, a few minutes in this conversation this morning to explore those a bit. So let me, uh, let me pause before I dive into uh, you know, a formulation of 
how we might get after this. I want us to think about um, a continuous release situation in mid-semester and analyze it a bit. But before we get there, I, I want to pause and see if people have reactions. I'll jump right in. Um, we actually did do one major upgrade mid-semester, and it did not go over well with faculty. Um, I think kind of in, in thinking about this, I think it depends on what kind of changes you're talking about as far as a mid-semester change versus a in-between semester change. So kind of in my head, and, and again, this is a little bit in the way of speculation, I think if you're, ha if you're making some kind of change that's going to really significantly affect the interface, either overall or for a majorly used tool, doing that mid-semester is not going to be well accepted. If you're just adding in a new feature, say, um, I'm trying to think of an example, um, How about adding, a, adding the possibility of, th this is something that just came in, adding the, the option to put an extra credit um, question in an assessment in tests and quizzes. That's not going to throw people off and they'd be more accepting of that. Um, so that's kind of my initial two cents. As I think it, it really depends on the, the magnitude and type of changes we're talking about. I'll stop. Um, thanks, Charles. So Heather notes, uh, we don't update mid-semester. Um, so what I've heard thus far is that, you know, big UI changes might not be accepted, but uh, value added features that don't disrupt user experience overall might be. Uh, what, what are some other views on this before we, we dive into an example to analyze? Well, one thing I, I think it's, it's a small distinction, but I think it can be an important one <laughs> is um, there's a difference between when the institution decides to apply their upgrades and whether or not features are included in point releases. So um, the whole idea is that we don't include new features in point releases because you don't want to surprise somebody who's just doing a maintenance release upgrade and um, getting bug fixes, right? Um, but at the same time, um, you know, each institution can choose whether or not they do an upgrade during the semester. So they could wait for end of term, theoretically, um, to pick up the next point release. Um, so anyway, just, just wanted to bring that up. Yeah, definitely. Michael notes, uh, who on the call self-hosts? Uh, I'm curious if uh, folks who self-host could put a plus one in the chat. That would be great because, yeah, definitely the, the impact is different. Yeah, so I, um, we, we are a long site customer. Um, and as Heather noted, we do not do uh, major releases mid semester. We do try to do point releases, um, dot releases uh, mid semester, um, and try to stay as current as uh, reasonably possible. Um, and I myself am a proponent of a more continuous release model, but I think there's a lot of nuance as Wilma and Charles have already uh, alluded to. And it's not necessarily, uh, unless there's a technical reason for it, which maybe we'll get into in a minute, it doesn't seem like it's a real dichotomy to me. It seems like you could still have planning of features to be released in certain times and and you can have more types of features released in other times and it doesn't have to all get lumped into this um, such a heavy lift dot zero um, release i'm just making a note here um so <clears throat> Yeah, so you know, there there is this question, right? I mean, so the notion of a continual release model, or as Michael, you know, 
clarifies for us in a way that's that's useful um, a more continuous release model. I mean, so uh, you know, the the notion of releasing releasing features more often, but possibly not all the time. I mean, there you know, so Earl always says that we're a community and we get to decide what we do. And so, uh, you know, in some ways, I think that the the first step is to say, you know, do we wish to release features more often? And what is the evidence that we have that that you know may or, may or may not be accepted? Uh, you know, and then it gets it gets back to a question of sustainability. You know, so how do we how do we do that in a way that's sustainable? How do we uh, allow institutions to still have some choice in the matter? Um, how do we make smart decisions about uh, you know what to release and when? So we still have to answer all those questions. Uh, let's see. So stuff in the chat. Um, uh, Samley Pan notes we only do point releases mid semester. Would you, Samley? Would, would you remind me what institution you're at? I forget. I'm sorry. Um, Earl notes that Sakai on a major yearly major release means significant new features come once a year, right? With a dot zero. A um, couple of people are, are noting that that uh, they do point releases during the year, so that already we're implementing bug fixes throughout the year. Uh, Sean notes that changes that would cause instructors to have to recreate things aren't ideal during a term, but can also be tricky if they're released too close to the start of the term. Yeah, exactly. Um, Heather notes we were discussing entirely new versions rather than point releases. I mean, I think that the, you know, the, the question that's been raised often is, well, Google releases stuff throughout the year. Now, granted, uh, you if you're a Google school, you have the opportunity to be on a slow meeting or, or fast track as opposed to when you get the release. Uh, you know, generally new features, people can opt out of them for a while, but there there always is a moment in time, not of the institution's choosing, where a new feature or a UI change will just be delivered, even for those folks who had opted out. Uh, let's see, Terry Go lightly notes, in dealing with multiple institutions and trying to time releases with different academic schedules, LAMP updates yearly and includes dot releases as, as they occur, and people have gotten used to this. Um, ah, Cape Town, thank you, thank you. <clears throat> uh, Tiffany knows they do small bug, bug fixes and backports at various times. UVA also self-hosts. So folks on the call who self-host, uh, Western, UVA, UCT, Cape Town. So it sounds like uh, we've got this combination of uh, hosted and self-hosted folks on the call, which is a good combination. Um, so Here's what I would like to, well, actually, let me pause for a second. Are there are there other reactions before we move on to a, a scenario that I want us to pick apart a little bit? So, all right, so so failing any other reactions, unless Matt, you were going to speak up. I was just kind of saying what Tiffany said. It's like there's there's two different models. There's the the people who don't change much in the release, like maybe mostly long site customers are cloud hosted, and there's places like UVA and previously Michigan and NYU that cu customize it seriously heavily, and and trying to keep on a continuous release model is is basically impossible for those schools. So. We've always had the, the almost the 50 50 split. Yeah. That's been kind of the problem. The more you uh, the more you customize, the harder it is to go to this model. But there's other things you can uh, I'll probably chime in later. Sure. All right. Well, so let me let me pose this question to you guys. Um, you know, I, I'd like us to dig into a you know a situation that. You know, it's. I wish I had defined this a little bit better, but I'm imagining a situation in which, you know, for institutions that are Google schools, uh, you've had to contend with a fairly significant upgrade in mid-semester. You know, so uh, maybe not, uh, you know, a full-on UI change, uh, but you know, but a, you know, maybe a significant feature change that uh, that required some adjusting of some of the menus or some of the buttons. Um, you. So I'd love to think about that a little bit, and I'd love to get you guys to react a bit to, in a situation like that, when you've experienced it, what has gone well and what could have been improved? So, so in, a, in a situation where Google releases 
a, uh, a useful feature, something that people have uh, wanted, or at least something that they, you know, they, they might find to be useful. What have you experienced that is a good thing, something that goes well about that kind of a situation? Uh, so I'm not the Google admin at our school, but we admin other tools in a similar nature. And um, what I really appreciate is when the feature is released in a way that I can still plan the deployment of that feature, right? So whether we would put it behind a property or a toggle in the admin UI or whatever. And, you know, usually we have some kind of test instance where I can deploy that feature um, at to, to a, one group of people for testing and getting familiar and then create a communication plan and then deploy that to users that, that I really appreciate. I think what's really great with Google is like, like Gmail specifically, but almost all their tools, they've got a gigantic settings page with like a thousand customizable settings. So you can almost revert back if you don't like something or you can pick, pick something up before, you know, they have something, you can preview something new. So it's all about being able to give that early preview or disable feature um that's what uh makes it a little bit easier to deal with if you can gradually get into something or get rid of it if you don't like it for a while are there situations that people have experienced in which uh the feature change was a major relief uh that it was it was well accepted because it's something that people really needed or wish they had. I wonder if we can think about, you know, a, a situation like that and then think about uh, what's what went well before we turn to what some of the challenges might be. Let's see stuff in the chat. Michael notes uh, the new Gmail UI was opt in for a while, then the default with opt out for a while. And now the only option. Yeah, I mean, so I think that a, a, a staggered release like that makes a lot of sense. Google does a pretty good job with that. Uh, Tiffany agrees when new features are easily enabled, disabled with a property, it's helpful. So, so we're, we're, we're coming back to the, the notion of control. Sean notes uh, a continuous release feature could allow schools to be more responsive to the instructors and academic needs of institutions by getting features and changes and improvements and bug fixes out sooner. Um, so it, it sounds like what I'm hearing is that for uh, non-traumatic UI changes for features that are useful but don't completely reshape the user experience and in a situation where there's some local control over whether to turn that feature on or off you know that it's available but not uh, you know automatically deployed when it's when it's released perhaps you know that that is a kind of scenario in which we might be able to develop a sustainable release more often model. So um, having having said that, maybe folks can can check me on that. Is that is that in fact what I'm hearing? Tiffany, Tiffany notes that some of our greatest relief features are ones they haven't been able to contribute back. Site builder and search. Yeah, I bet those have made a big difference for you guys. <clears throat> Josh, I, I'd say that's a reasonable characterization of, of what we've been talking about. OK. So let me ask you this question um, then. So. If we're if we're contemplating a model in which uh, there is uh, more frequent releases of features, you know, maybe maybe not fully continuous, but but more regular, um, and if and it's a model in which there's uh, early preview, there's the ability to disable the feature, there's uh, there's a a, a progression, um, and we you know Earl would probably note that we have a progression for feature release now that you know stuff is is available for a while and then it's uh, default, but uh, you can revert back for a while, and then it's turned off. You know, version to version. Um, so, let me ask you this: I mean, it, in groups like this, 
you know, we've, we've got a bunch of people in the room now. We have 15 people in the room, um, you know, and we these are conversations that we could have at Sakai camp with 30 people in the room or, you know, at our online community meetings with probably more than 30 people around. You know, the, the question in my mind is, you know, how do we how do we validate this kind of a decision? I mean, is, is there is there user research that we ought to be doing? And if so, what would that look like? Terry asks if overthinking could be happening. Maybe. Can you say more? Terry's typing. Someone else want to speak up while Terry's typing? We can multitask. I guess I'd be interested in, in, in the type of the, the user research. I mean, generally, I am in favor of that. Uh, but I can imagine if you ask users if they want change, it's a pretty easy no for them to give you. So the questioning would have to really get at what their values are there versus like, no, don't don't change on me. Unless I'm misinterpreting what you mean. Yeah, no, I, I think we'd have to be we'd have to be a little bit smarter about the, the uh, about the, the design of the research, you know, because I think you're right. You know, if you just if you straight up ask someone, do you like it when stuff changes on you? You know, we, we know what the answer to that is going to be. Um, you know, I. There seems to be, there, I mean, so Michael's expressed some support for user research. Tiffany's expressed some support. Um, you know, my sense is that, well, actually, let, let me ask you this question. Um, you know, it, my sense is that doing some potential, you know, potentially doing some interviews with faculty members or, you know, I, I think that the challenge with a survey is getting, getting the, the uh, the, the levels of response that will actually be useful. My guess is a, a qualitative study will end up being a little bit more, you know, more effective for this, you know, but if we were to interview, uh, you know, a faculty member or two at multiple institutions to explore this question of uh, the, the value of change and the way to, you know, best mitigate some of the negative impacts of change, uh, how accepting faculty might be of change, um, I'm. I'm curious whether you guys think that that would be would would might something like that provide insight that would be useful for us, or would we be left with the same kind of conversation where we say, well, some people like it, some people don't. What do we do now? I think it depends on how much the change is. Like there's a lot of, like I really haven't, you know, I've been using Google tools for a long time and I really haven't noticed the change. And even like with like Canvas, I really don't notice the change when they do it. It's just, it's like, the, I know, like GitHub did a major thing like a couple of weeks ago where they completely changed everything around. Everything was still there, but they moved it all around and everybody noticed that change. And within like a day, there was like an extension to revert it to the old way that GitHub looked. So. Um, because they didn't provide that. So, but it's like, like a lot of the major cloud vendors, you just, it kind of like the changes kind of just, just happen without in places that you really aren't paying attention to, I think. It depends on if it's like a big change. Like when we did like grade book to grade book two, that was kind of like a gradual change. And we didn't really just remove the old grade book until grade book two was ready to go and had at least all the features, if not, you know, or all the major features. But that's kind of like, yeah. Those those cloud vendors, though, their their users are the world, right? I mean, so they have a different user base, <laughs> right? Sure. And and how do you consult the world to say when is the right time to do this, right? Where you know, at, in the universities, when they're in control of their LMS, 
you know, that's a very different paradigm, you know. Well, it's, it's it, but it, it's like long site, you know, it, do they need to like, they don't need to wait for university permission usually to do releases. It's kind of like, it's kind of the question between, the, there's like a difference between the long site hosted customers and the self-hosted customers, as Josh was saying at the beginning that, you know, is there, are people going to pick it up as fast? I never really felt that self-hosted customers picked up, like, I, I feel like they'd never really even use like the X branch, like long site, we always use the X branch and. Or some yeah, well, customers yeah. probably waited for the dot releases and only used those and maybe ran out the dot release and didn't upgrade for a year. In in many ways, the, the X branch is a uh, is a um, a form of um, continuous delivery. Yeah. It you is. Know? You know, it's 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 changes go in there and you can pick them up right away. And um, which is exactly what this is. Um, so I, I would say we do do it. Um, and I think we leave it up to the universities. Um, the, the only thing that we're uh, sort of, uh, let's say, restrictive of is what goes into those .x branches. We usually typically, like Josh started out saying, we typically only put bug fixes. But does that mean that zero features go into those? And the answer is no. There are, I think there was one feature that made it into the 20.1 release um, that, that to go in there. So it's a very low number. Um, and um, and I would say that the features that do make it are the ones that are like very low risk, meaning, uh, you know, they don't fall into the category of some, you know, bigger, larger change um, that that happens. Right. This has been Sakai's plan for like forever. Almost. We had a document from maybe 2010 about this. And it's just if it's there's if you can disable with a property, there's low impact, put the feature in. It's like a it's it's kind of blurry between what a bug what a bug and a feature is mm -hmm. too, but Matter because we fact, don't have like we we don't have really automated database changes that work really well, we kind of limit yeah. what we do. And, and that's one of the questions we ask too when we usually include a feature in a maintenance release. Does it have a toggle? Right? Yeah. Um, because we want to always isolate ourselves from the from the the perspective of oh, there might be an institution that uh, doesn't want that feature. Right. Mm -hmm. And they want to be able to have it off. And usually when we deploy any new feature like that, it is always in the, let's say, in the off mode. Right. So that this way there is no change to to anyone. But if somebody actually wanted to use that particular feature, um, you know, they would then have to turn it on in order to make the change. Right. So so I, I mean, I'm just saying we do kind of do some of this now. Um, and it's the dot X branch. I mean, that's, that's essentially, um, the continuous deployment. Um, but it is really, it's a restricted version, I would say of like what we're talking about today. Yeah. Today we're it's talking about, fast, a much, yes. right. Yeah. Today we're talking about a, a larger kind of, you know, Hey, let's put, you know, let's, let's put, you know, more things into the dot x branch for example maybe we wouldn't call it the dot x branch you know in the future who knows what that might look like but um you know it's you know it's you know let's put more stuff into that you know yeah, than we, just bug fixes and things yeah, we've we've talked about this before we've had like the dot x faster branch or whatever you want to call it, the dot x plus plus and we but we there was always challenges it's not just it's not a reason of us not wanting to do it. it. There's a lot of, there's a lot of problems with actually getting to there. And, and I know we talked about this in the past recently and in the far past, but there has been, you know, you know, fake trying to figure out how we could do that. And that's a, that would be what we'd have to do for our next step if that was desired. So here's, some, here's something I'd like to explore a little bit. Um, so I want to go back to Terry's comments in the chat. So she says, some features like the date manager have such value that delaying the release of it is actually a bad thing. Um, but there's not a major impact on overall UI and a great value for course management. She notes, on the other hand, a tool like uh, dashboard or upfront analytics might be more disruptive and maybe could, should be better presented with some more warning or some more marketing. You know, so we're we're exploring this notion of <clears throat> um, you know, a category of low impact, uh, uh, high value features. And writing that down, low impact. Uh, 
And I, I, I wonder if we could spend a little bit of time as a group uh, developing some criteria to help us determine what low impacts and high feature might look like. I mean, so if we had a, a checklist of criteria uh, that we could evaluate a feature against. Um, so we, we've heard, uh, does it have a toggle? Does it have a toggle? Yeah, rubric, exactly. So, uh, you know, is it, uh, you know, is uh, the user experience largely unchanged? Or is it, you know, is there is there disruption to the user experience? What else would be, so what else would be characteristic of a low impact, high value feature? So it has a toggle, it doesn't disrupt the user experience, what else? Um, sorry, Sean, I'm, I'm scrawling these down on a piece of paper in front of me. Um, but I, I will I will capture these and and put them in the um, in the etherpad. A lot of times, um, sort of the low impact things are um, things that didn't exist at all before versus a change to an existing feature. Yeah, that's uh, definite definitely tr true. So Wil Wilma say more. So describe in more detail things that uh, didn't exist before that aren't an overall new feature. Um, well, the example that Terry um, brought up with the date manager, there wasn't a date manager before. Um, so it's a it's a brand new thing. It's a its own tab in the interface, and it's kind of isolated from other things. So it's not really going to change the experience of how you would use the site info tool. You've just got this new tab here with additional functionality. So things of that nature, where you know it's like an added value, but it's not really changing too much of the features that you are already using. Yeah, versus like when they change like the Samago interface with the how the you know the tabs were and everything. Yeah. So if there's something that you're already doing and then all of a sudden it's different, um, mm -hmm. then that's more disruptive to the user because they have to go back and tweak things or maybe change their workflow. A new grader in assignments. Yeah. Yeah. So and, and Charles, the, the the new grader in in assignments would it would be low impact, high value, or high impact? No, that's higher impact because that's a totally different interface that, that the instructor isn't necessarily. If, if, if I'm grading assignments one day and then I go in and grade my assignments the next day and it looks totally different, that's not going to make me happy. Although there yeah. is the ability to turn it off. Yep. So that, I think, kind of balances the disruption. If, if you have the option to just go back to classic view, Granted. Um, yeah. I mean, you know, so this this is interesting. So um, it sounds like, uh, you know, well, actually, I'd love to get some more feedback about Grader because, you know, you're right. It's a major change in the workflow, but it would have a toggle, you know. So uh, this is one of those things that, that is uh, an, an edge finder case, right? So uh, it changes things. It's fairly high impact, but it would have a, but it would have a toggle. So uh, does the group think that something like a grader would fit in this category or that something like a grader would be high impact and really ought to be, you know, in a less frequent uh, release model? If something can be toggleable, it seems like it should always be eligible for faster release. Like even if we like added a CK editor five and it could, you could toggle it back to four. It's you can, we should be able to do that. Uh, I'm hoping that that actually happens like that. <laughs> yeah, I kind of uh, agree and like say the opposite is true too, right? Like if something is high impact, it should be required to be toggleable if we're going to mm -hmm. put it right. Like uh, maybe that's already the case. Um, well, it isn't. It isn't in the major releases. We make it often so it it's the only way you can go. Let's see, Sean notes uh, a toggle potentially causes more work to, though for both development and QA. Yes, true. Yes. Um, yeah, and there and there are fixes that, that don't ever 
um, are that are, that are likely never palatable for this type of delivery, right? I mean, we're talking. I mean, not every fix. Like for example, if we do some some huge uh, upgrade under the covers, like let's say we upgrade Hibernate or we upgrade Spring, you know, none of that is going to be compatible with uh, a can, you know, with with sort of this kind of stuff, right? Mm -hmm. um, because you know that that requires a change across, you know you know it's a large change across everything you can't mix and match things right uh api changes are a big are another big one right um anytime the anytime there's an api addition typically you might run into problems if you uh you know if um you know if you're not deploying you know everything as well so there there are definitely some changes that just cannot that are not meant to be part of um a uh you know part of this discussion i think you know so you just have to keep that in mind still um but i think there is like the problem like let's say there is some change let's say like the hibernate 5 upgrade happened and somebody developed a new feature and they used hibernate 5 annotations right because we were on and now somebody wants to run that in like uh, a previous version or something it, it, there is work required to adapt it and things like that. So there's always yeah. those kinds of like things to to contend with. Um, but you I think almost have to rewrite it if you want to get it back there. Exactly. Back and I, exactly. And so I think there's always there's always going to be this level of you know there's always going to be well can this change be you know be um, used you know, at a faster pace, you know, is this change acceptable, you know, to, for that? And, and a lot of them are, but uh, some of them aren't like, for example, the, uh, the honor pledge, the assignments honor pledge that changed that used to be at the end of the work that used to kind of be at the end of the workflow. And then it switched to the beginning of the workflow. Like that would be uh, that. I don't know how institutions would take that, like in the middle of a, or how, you know, users would react to that in the middle, like all of a sudden one day it's one way and another day it's another way. And and then documentation. That's probably one of those things that, that would not be as well accepted. Because right. again, that, that, that interface change as opposed to a new add-on feature that you can choose to use or not. Yeah. And the other thing to call to about all of this all of what we're discussing about adding these things in different ways this requires more effort on the community to do these things like like to code and uh, like providing things with toggles that require them actually and things like that and then there's and then there's all the qa testing there's all the there's all kinds of additional uh load that comes along with this type of model this model is in by no means a simpler model it is a more complex model and it requires more resources in order to perform it right i think what we do in the community is like a minimal version of this the minimal right um we do what is minimal to 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 for for what we do to to do more would require more effort and more resource and and actually in some sense it's not just more burden on the community it's also a burden on institutions because if if you're oh, doing yeah. more major features then that requires more testing and double checking on our end you know as before we actually deploy because sure. we usually try and do at least some testing even for dot releases before we put those out yep um so if we're getting more major releases, more major things going on, that means that we're we need to do a little bit more checking on our end before we deploy, and maybe we don't have the resources for that. And that's and that's where this model is more resource intensive. You know, it's not just community resource; it's it's resource everywhere. It's resource right. in the community. It's resource at the institutions um you know it's it's kind of covers all of that but it does kind of spread it out throughout the year and and i think michael mentioned earlier that instead of having you know sort of this really intense build up to a major release that you kind of you know spread some of the resources out throughout the entire 
calendar year. Yeah, I would agree with that, Wilma, but I also think that in the end, if you were to add it all up, it would be more than what we're doing now. Okay, that's fair. So it would still be more. I mean, even though, like you said, you you kind of spread it out, but in the end, you would be doing more. So it's it's 1050. Um, Charles, I want to be mindful of time. Do I have right. time to pose one more question or do you want to do you want to tie it off here? Because we're we're sort of approaching, it seems to me, a, a, a stopping point. Um, no, go for it. OK. What the um, heck? <laughs> live dangerously, people. All right. <clears throat> um, so the, the the question that's a, that's occurring to me as I'm listening to Earl talk about the the resource intensiveness of a what I'm calling now a more frequent release model, um, you know, is that we we might adopt a model in which we release features a little bit more frequently, but not a lot more frequently. Uh, you know, we might we might decide that uh, certain kinds of features are above the line and could be released with toggles uh, in, in dot releases. I mean, so we could anoint certain features to be that valuable and, and do that with it. So I'm, I'm kind of curious, you know, as a, as a final question here for today, and then we can, we can continue this conversation in, in other venues. Um, what do people think about a model in which, uh, you know, one or two or three features over the course of a year are deemed important enough to release uh, with a toggle, with the extra testing, you know, with the with the extra effort uh, in dot releases. Is that is that a viable approach? Earl says we we do this now. Yeah, but but we don't we don't. We, it's not it's not structural, right? You know, we sort of we will sometimes do it, and we will spend a lot of time sort of you know going back and forth about whether something you know meets the cut. Yeah, we I'm don't, kind of we, don't curious, but, we don't identify these high level features like you're saying but we I, I think you know if we did we would think about the things Earl said like we would try to make we try to write them so that we don't use the newest APIs and technologies we don't use we make it so there's a way to disable it from the beginning and you know we think about that stuff fr from the beginning knowing that it's going to go back rather than putting it in and expecting it's not going to because it's otherwise you got to go back and do tons of work to get it back in there and i've experienced that a lot before where people are like we really need this back really need this back and i'll spend like you know 20 or 30 hours trying to backport some gigantic feature that everybody wants or we do do this now but it's, it's it can be more painful yeah for sure <laughs> i mean mike michael framed this in a good way you know sort of declaring you know declaring slightly more frequent release in some sustainable way as the the new rule versus the exception i mean i think yeah we, we do it now on, on an exception driven basis for sure do you want me to say real quick how we like just like if somebody wanted a new feature like now that they knew and they said look i want this new feature in a in a I mean, it's no different than any other Jira, even a bug Jira. You go and say, hey, please merge this to this version, right? You ask the question. That's, that's what the please merge is. It is a question. It is a question to say, can I have this merge to this version of Sakai, right? What will happen is at that uh, when that occurs, when it comes time to do merging, and obviously it's been verified, right? Because we don't merge anything that's not been verified. That's just flat out kind of a thing um and once it's been verified and that please merge is on there and it's a feature um there are people that um will see this and they will ask questions right um sometimes it's the it's the branch man maintainers that do this sometimes it'll be other people in the community it doesn't always have to be just one person but there is going to be a uh sort of a vetting that process that goes on to see if this feature can be brought back, right? And this is where this is where what Matt was saying is it toggleable? Does it meet this? Does it have API changes? Is it compatible with this old version of you know this library or whatever? All these technical questions are kind of then uh, um, answered, right? And it's it's only at that point that when you get a yes to all those questions that you get a 
okay, we can we can merge this one, right? This is a possible, this doesn't, you know, we're, we can do this. And then comes the question, okay, if we technically can merge this, right? There's no technical boundary to it. Um, the, the next question comes, you know, should we merge this, right? And this is usually where, um, um, for example, um, if it's gonna be deemed to, um, um, you know, other other uh, uh, areas in Sakai, other like community, like teaching, learn it, they can comment, you know, should we merge this? Should we, should we not merge this? I do remember not too long ago where there was a, a feature that was merged for something to the grade book around points. I think it was like extra credit or I'm not sure. It was something around that area. And um, I remember that teaching and learning actually voted to have it removed from a release, right? And so we've gone the opposite direction, right? Um, so, so we go one direction and we go the opposite direction with these kinds of things. So um, I know. think if something gets hit for like for technical issues, we kind of usually just stop there, though. Right. We do. And, because uh, until the work is done, there's no there's there's until yeah. the technical problem is resolved. Right. Like, let's say making it toggleable or something like that. That would be a technical thing. Um, you know, then it's then it's, you know, yeah. then we kind of <laughs> stop like what you say. We need to figure out how to push past that, too, if it's maybe possible to get get EDF involved or get the original developer involved or get somebody involved to get money raised or something to get that in if that's desirable enough. But it's usually it's like if it's if it take almost everything in the past, if it took too long, we're like, it's, this is not going to happen. It's going to take too long. Wait till the next major release. I mean, I, I like the way you frame the questions, though. So can we merge this technically? Is there a technical barrier to merging? Should we merge this? Uh, is there a value to merging it? You know, I think it'd be neat to get some structure around those questions so that you know at, at a minimum right people can decide that they can people can understand what the process is to advocate for something being released out of band and figure out you know what the criteria would be that we've agreed upon that would you know generally get something like that into the flow of discussion i mean i keep thinking about a you know a, a more frequent release model i mean if we if we do a lot of this stuff now the question is how do we you know how do we surface what we do so that people know what the levers are and know how to invoke them? You know, even if we're not moving toward a continuous release model. Um, yeah. for, food for thought. It's 1057. That we do need to stop. Yes. <laughs> um, quick discussion about what we should talk about. Next meeting is scheduled for August 5th. We don't have anything scheduled. One thing I, I'm thinking two things we could consider. Um, is do we want to continue this discussion next time or we could do a Jirapalooza? Any thoughts? I don't know the agenda for the uh, the meeting next Friday well enough. Wilma, do you think there will be follow-up from that? That would be um, I think this would be a good topic to put on the agenda. There's not a whole lot on the agenda as as it stands right now for the open-ended discussion portion so um so i'm thinking that there's definitely going to be room for for this topic well if we discuss it there then maybe we wouldn't want to do it here um maybe we'll just leave it open for the moment we, it's actually three weeks away so just due to the vagaries of the calendar so i think maybe i'll leave it open and see if anything pops up if nothing does then We'll do it, Jirapalooza. Just want to say thanks, gang, for entertaining this conversation. I think yeah. it, I, I feel like we, we learned a fair bit. I will try and scribe my notes into the Etherpad. Okay. In the bottom, put in the bottom there our maintenance branch merge policy that's been on Confluence since 2010. It's almost like what we described today. And we've kind of like tried to abide by that, but you know, some of this stuff can use updating clarification. But it's always so we've we've always had a way to get we've always thought about fast releases, at least for 10 years we have. Yeah, if it were easy, everyone would do it, right? Right. 
Yeah, th this is my famous saying. This is not new in Sakai. It's been here forever. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You, you'll hear me say, I say that so often now because we get new people coming in and they don't realize, they don't, you know, they don't, uh, they don't realize that we've contended with this for like a significant amount of time, right? Previously. It's not just something new that just popped out of the hat. <laughs> All righty. Well, I'm going to stop the recording here.